Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Martin Smith here on Tuesday, the 10th of September, 2024. The nights are drawing in, I'm afraid. Uh, school holidays are over. Kids are back at school. The leaves are falling and the wonderful, wonderful autumn is about to uh, to descend upon us. Beautiful time of the year. Um, I'm Martin Smith, Chairman and Founder of the SASIG, and we have with us today, uh, let me just get rid of that, we have with us today Mike Olachik, who is the CEO of CyberReady. Now, I am really looking forward to this presentation this morning. Um, we have a massive crowd of the SASIG membership joining us because it's about security awareness, and this is the Security Awareness Special Interest Group. Hello, Stu. Please Tell everybody who you are and where you are. Do say hello, everyone. You know the format. <laughs> um, yes, Mike, I am so looking forward to our chat today. Uh, Mike is speaking from Freiburg in Germany, where he is trying to have a holiday. Um, <laughs> but he's a bit like me. This always comes first. Um, what we'll do, Mike, if you could just pop yourself on mute while I just go through the um, go through these, uh, these 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 notices. Hello, Leslie from sunny Warwickshire. Oh, that's unusual. Um, right, Nadia, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, quickly, the house rules for today. You all know these anyway, but I will just mention them. Um, the Chatham House rule, please respect our speakers and our questioners. Anybody that comes in to make a, make a comment or ask a question. Um, you can attribute what's said today. Oh, sorry, you can report what's said today. You just cannot attribute it to any particular speaker, especially Mike. Um, that means that we can have free ranging conversations on all sorts of things. Um, do join in. We have some questions and answers in the chat coming up. If you want to just throw in your three Hayton's worth, it will be lovely. Give us your feedback at the end. That's really important. And finally, get involved. Tell your teams about SASIG. Um, that's the quickest way for us to spread the word is if you get your colleagues to join in as well um, and the peers in other organizations. Oh, and a big point from me. I keep mentioning this. Um, your supply chain. If you have organizations that supply to you um, that may be smaller, may not have the same sort of resource or knowledge that you have in your own organizations, then help them out because by helping them out, you're helping yourselves out. So you, one of the things you can do from that is to um, is to get them to join the SASIG and come to these amazing webinars. Next slide, please. All sorts of upcoming webinars. You know I don't go through these in detail. They're all on the website. But what's of note is that we're really more or less back to one a day now, apart from when we're holding an in-person event. And that's in demand from our members. There are a we have so many things that we'd like to talk about. We could do two a day, uh, but we're back to one a day, which is, I think it's uh, it's quite uh, it's quite. I was going to say quite amazing. It is really that that we manage to do this every morning at eleven o'clock, and you know it's it's lovely to do. It's a privilege. Next slide. The in person events about one a week. Not every week, but most weeks there'll be something on. I'm hosting the legal sessing, the legal sector SASIG next week. Hello, Ian Cruxton. Um, we've got big thing on the 24th and 25th of September. You know we're part of 19 Group now. It's their big uh, international cyber expo, Olympia. We're running the Global Cyber Summit for the uh, the, the two days that it's on, and. Um, We've also got our gala dinner on the evening of the 24th. So that's a big, big thing for us. If you can get yourselves along to Olympia, please do so. We've got a big meeting on the 1st of October hosted by BT on awareness. That's always a popular one. It's going to be a massive crowd there. We're going back to Dublin in October. All sorts going on. Again, look at the calendar. Do sign up. A lot of those will be streamed as well. So you can join in online. Next slide. Huge thank you to our supporters. I say this every time. These are inside our circle of trust. These are organizations that are committed to contributing to the debate on a regular basis. They are, they are the good guys. 
they they understand the SASIG model, which is about sharing and about building trust. Um, if you want to be in contact with any of them, then please just let us know. You know they do the vast majority of the webinars now, and they are really supportive uh, to us and, and very, very good friends. Um, Cyber Ready is a guest here today, and there'll be a poll at the end. If you want to hear more from them on this occasion, then please just let us know and we'll put you in touch. Next slide, please. And here we are. So, Nadia, if you could come back to the screen with me, and Mike, if you unmute yourself, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Martin. Thanks for having me here. We are delighted. Pleasure. You and I met some months ago and started chatting, and um, the majority of my audience, our audience here today, know me very well. So you can imagine that as soon as we started talking about awareness, I lit up, and I was intrigued by your story, both your your life journey and what you're doing with Cyber Ready. And I I realized straight away that this was something that the Sassig crowd would like to hear about. And and so I invited you along to give this talk today. Um, I hope this becomes a regular thing. I hope we can persuade you to become part of our community. But in the meantime, um, I'd like our audience to uh, understand more about how you got to your approach and what your approach is. So before we go to the slides, Tell us a bit about yourself, Mike. You're speaking currently from Freiburg, but that's not where you live, is it? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying, as you uh, as you mentioned, to uh, catch up some uh, holidays. Uh, but uh, I'm living uh, in Israel uh, for the last six years. And uh, if I'm going back to my youth, I started my journey as a basketball player. Quite quick, I understood that I'm not going to be the next star, not not the next day Michael Jordan, uh, even though we are sharing uh, the same age, the same first name, but probably that's the only connection we have. And then I became a coach. Uh, I coached basketball for a couple of years. It uh, led me to uh, to study some psychology. And uh, just by chance, when I joined the IDF, uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, I found myself at the research department for training, which uh, led me basically to my professional career as a training and development expert. Uh, I did it for many years. Uh, and again, some love stories, some different issues led me uh, almost 25 years ago to the National Israeli Security Agency. Uh, they invited me to join again as a, as a learning or knowledge management expert. And uh, when you are uh, enough time in, a, in the neighborhood, uh, you get your expertise. So, so uh, combining my knowledge of uh, learning, learning science and security, uh, uh, how to say, uh, enforced me uh, to execute many innovations. Uh, you know, security is a dynamic field. You cannot go or lean on a traditional. <clears throat> Uh, learning methods so we had to uh, to invent some and about 10 years ago uh, I found myself uh, founding cyber ready uh, on some uh, or, or relying on uh, some uh, old notions from my career at the uh, Israeli uh, National Security Agency and uh, that's where I am today, leading uh, Cyber Ready uh, with a different approach, which combines understanding, deep understanding of security, many sports elements, 
and you know, getting to peak performance needs a lot of practice, less theory, more practice. Basically, that's the main uh, idea that is behind Cyber Ready name. Cyber Ready, readiness comes first. And I think that's about it. Well, I'm intrigued. I uh, This is the Security Awareness Special Interest Group. Security Awareness is the genesis of our community. It's not all we talk about by a long shot. We talk about all aspects of cybersecurity now, but I knew that this would um, this would attract a huge audience as it has because this is something that's in all our minds. How on earth do we improve the security, education, awareness, behavior around this topic? Nobody wants nobody wants to be more secure. We have to try and persuade them. So if you could share your screen, then we will um, listen to your presentation. If I come back on the screen, it's because I've got a question. If anybody has a question, then please put your hands up, pop it in the question box. Um, but no, off you go, sir. I can't wait to hear this. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so good morning or good uh, noon time for uh, most of you. Uh, <clears throat> My name is Mike. I'm the founder and the CEO of Cyber Ready. As mentioned, we're an Israeli uh, company. And <clears throat> I want to try and break some myth uh, about awareness training. First of all, I think that's the a bad name. Awareness training should be changing its name. Uh, there's some debates uh, around the community what is the right name? My suggestion, of course, is to go for readiness. Awareness is kind of a fuzzy term and I'll uh, uh, try to demonstrate it uh, along with some of the myth here. If, as for my background, I already uh, shared it with uh, uh, Martin, so I'll skip. <clears throat> In, in two sentences, CyberReady provides a unique platform for awareness training. Uh, it's a program, it's not a content library. We have our unique uh, approach and basically it runs autonomously, uh, actually working for our customers and it's not something that our customer needs to operate in a way, <clears throat> but it's not a sales pitch. So just keep it in mind. So <clears throat> just to, uh, to give you some context about how this uh, presentation is going to look like, uh, always on the left-hand side, you'll find a myth. And I wanted to start with this one, with the, the famous uh, Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, <clears throat> I guess most of you know that uh, there's a missing piece at the bottom, which is the connection to the internet. But uh, the truth is that Maslow never created any type of hierarchy and the theory behind it was never validated. So <clears throat> by the way, Maslow himself uh, wrote an article against the, uh, the hierarchy but his uh, best friends in the US told him that uh, since the model works so fine, don't, don't disturb it. So we all use it, uh, but bear in mind, it's probably far from, <clears throat> probably far from reality. So when, <clears throat> when we are coming to deal with the awareness training, I think one of the, oh, sorry, one of the most important things to know about ourselves is what is your basic knowledge resource to deal with this domain. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> from my uh, experience with the community, uh, there are very few experts in learning. Uh, a lot comes from a security experts, <clears throat> communication experts, but uh, those who are dealing with learning, 
uh, as far as I know, are only a few. And that's led me uh, actually to bring this uh, uh, or to shed some light, uh, let's say, about current myth and how to break them. So I'll start with the first one. <clears throat> I'm not sure if we'll, uh, uh, we'll covering it all, but uh, I'm starting with this one. ABC model uh, stands for awareness, behavior, and culture. Again, <clears throat> some will say that we must start with awareness as the first step towards behavior change, and then comes culture. A behavior change was the, I mean, the, 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 the community started to deal with behavior change only a couple of, a, only a couple of years ago, a, and still SASIG still holds the name a, as the a security awareness interest group. <clears throat> but as mentioned, awareness is a fuzzy term. When you want to uh, try and measure awareness, you go to some behavior metrics. So why still deal with awareness? So we suggest a different approach and a different reality. Readiness or behavior <clears throat> should be the focus of the approach. Behavior is a reflection of the culture because culture is already exists. Culture by definition is the shared basic assumption of a group. So there are some models who are a, a telling that there is no culture at first, and then we need to build the culture, which is untruth. <clears throat> Any company, any group has its own culture, even if not yet defined, defined or articulated, but it's always there. What is awareness? Awareness is so many things and nothing, actually it's nothing because <clears throat> a, a, maybe the simplest example will, do, will be that if you take a poster and put it in the uh, in the bathroom or in the toilets, it's good enough. It provides some kind of awareness, but is that what we are actually willing to achieve? I guess not. And I think that if anyone will ask himself, what is the goal? What is the learning objective? It will always comes to any kind of behavior or to risk reduction, but <clears throat> not awareness. So my first idea is that awareness is dead and we should change it to something which is close to or readiness. Second, uh, due to the last, uh, I think, two years of conversation uh, about awareness or not awareness, uh, Gartner came with one idea, and this, I think from Sans uh, and, and some others took a, a new approach about human risk management and, and put it as the next big thing. Human risk management is a, a technology mostly that uh, is aimed to reduce or limit the human decisions. It assumes that humans put a risk to the company and we need to somehow not to reduce it, not to educate, not to teach, but to limit it. <clears throat> but when you are looking at the problem from a learning perspective a, and you have not a negative approach but an optimistic approach about human beings, you want to empower their ability to make the right decisions when there are 
alone, working from home, working in the organizational uh, environment. So <clears throat> human risk management is a, an old technology that probably a, a, a failed. And learning is just a different species that is our a, a expertise. And I guess most of the team here, most of the audience here is willing to a, a, take not the technology approach, but the human a, a human learning processes. So that's the second. The next one, uh, we all tend to uh, think and uh, that the threat landscape is dynamic and is relevant for awareness training. I might surprise you, but when it comes to humans, uh, there's nothing new. Uh, we might uh, add new uh, devices that you are using. Uh, maybe our uh, digital wor world is, uh, uh, or we are connected with more devices to the digital environment. But when it comes to humans manipulations, the same crimes, the same breaches are done the same old way. There is nothing new from the threat landscape into any kind of relevance to so-called to awareness training. And here is a, a, an example that I, I, I got from one of our customers just last week when I was visiting in Germany. And we discussed what is this sophisticated new approaches by, a, by the adversaries or by the hackers. So here's an example of a, a large corporation that was a, targeted by 800 emails from 500 different domains with 80 different types of messages and they were all personalized. So, so my customer said, this is a real, real sophisticated approach and how do we deal with it? But when you analyze what is really happening to the individual who is receiving those emails, by the end of the day, each individual receive one email from one domain. It's only one type of message that is a, 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 a combating, <clears throat> and he is the only one that is being personalized. So for the individual, there's nothing new. There is nothing too sophisticated. So there's a huge difference between the myth about the dynamic landscape and the new techniques that hackers are using. And when you come to, an, to analyze and to understand what is the individual experience, I would argue that there is nothing really new. Same for AI. Does AI really change what we are experiencing is corporate employees. Again, <clears throat> I think that in <clears throat> when it comes to social engineering, we'll see the same old tricks. There is nothing new. The generation of the attacks might be more efficient and with the larger varieties. But again, as I showed in the earlier example, for the individual, he will keep receiving the same old tricks. Okay. Um, so we ended up with a threat landscape and now moving to some of the myth about awareness training programs. First one is about phishing test. Uh, for some reason, uh, in the UK, there is a lot of debate of whether phishing tests are uh, 
doing the right job, effective or not. But most of the community believes that phishing tests are essentials. And I want to argue that phishing tests are bad. Uh, I think that no one really likes to be tested and tests are not really a good learning experience. Uh, in reality, we all know that uh, we can learn from mistakes and tests are more kind of a summarized, summative approach and not a, a, an evaluative approach. So <clears throat> what we should put as a truth for awareness training programs is to have fishing simulations and a learning process or an immediate learning process, but let's put the test out of this school. Tests are creating a negative approach and currently most of the awareness uh, practitioners are seeking to have a positive uh, feedback or a positive uh, attitudes from the employees. Tests are not uh, doing any better here. Another uh, common approach is that we should leave employees uh, during weekends. Uh, and in some of the companies that uh, we met in the past, uh, the phishing simulations or the phishing tests were not allowed during the weekends. The funny thing here is that if you ask incident response team or your SOC teams, we all know that most of the incidents are occurring during the weekends. So there is no, uh, no smart thing uh, in uh, stop running your simulations during the weekends. Next one. Uh, when it comes to fishing simulations, uh, we uh, uh, let's say the myth is that high click rates uh, have an impact. High click rate means that many employees are clicking and uh, actually falling prey to the attacks or to the simulations. <clears throat> is that making any good? I would argue that the answer is simply not, okay? A, if you want to focus on improvement, if you want to focus on behavior change, if you want to focus not only on shocking your employees, high click rate is meaningless. You should focus on a large variety of scenarios you should hope that your employees will recognize that these are fishing simulations. These are fishing exercises. It's good to be right, but you need to manage the balance between failure, not failure, sorry, with, between falling prey to simulations and being successful in simulations. <clears throat> Awareness, uh, again, as the, uh, as the old theme, uh, was about some uh, creating fear, uh, providing threats, horror stories, and the high click rate was probably a good match in that sense. But if you really want to be focusing on learning processes, High click rate is meaningless. Another interesting thing about <clears throat> running fishing simulations is the difficulty level. Uh, the myth is that we are sure that we know what is a difficult simulation and what is the difficulty level. By the way, we at Cyber Ready started our way <clears throat> with those uh, uh, definitions. 
but sure, a uh, uh, short enough, uh, our, data, our data showed us that <clears throat> a difficulty level can be defined only by the responses. Uh, <clears throat> it's not a pre-assumed, it's not pre-assumed, and I'll give you a simple example, okay? Uh, if you want to understand if one plus one is a difficult question, of course, for most of us, I guess, it will be an easy one. Why? Because we all know what is the right answer. But if you'll take a, a three years old a kid, he might be missing the right one, the right, uh, the right answer. So it's not embedded in the question slash the simulation. The difficulty level can be only defined by the level of answers or responses. So you can try like the hacker and then know what worked and what didn't work. But pre-assuming that this simulation will get a high click rate, and this one is not good enough for that purpose, is wrong. Okay, I'll skip this one. Another myth that I want to uh, try and break is about the uh, reporting button or the reporting upon phishing, which uh, seems to be kind of a key metric today. Uh, I assume it was, I'm not assuming actually, I know <clears throat> it was suggested to the community by one of the vendors about 12 years ago. But the fact is, and there are many uh, uh, supported uh, uh, research about it, that the reporting on phishing has a very low ROI. The false positive is huge. And it's better to have a more accurate machines than relying on the reporting as a key metric in awareness training. So <clears throat> um, I think just a couple of a uh, month ago, Ponymon uh, Institute in the US published just another uh, research about how low is the ROI on uh, human reporting. And uh, I think the, uh, the efforts that organizations are putting to encourage their employees to report, uh, don't come to, a, a, to the expected results. And I don't blame anyone for that. I guess a, a, the effort is, is, is in vain and uh, we should lower our expectations from reporting on phishing. Okay, I'll skip on that. Okay. The next, uh, <clears throat> the next myth that I uh, uh, want to deal with is about content. Uh, content is currently uh, perceived as the number one tool for for awareness training, and the. Uh, when someone uh, fails in the phishing, uh, phishing test or the phishing simulations, uh, he needs to complete a computer-based training uh, probably during the next uh, two or three weeks. So <clears throat> this leads us to a uh, break two different myths here. One, content as a whole, is not a solution. When someone makes a mistake, he needs to understand exactly what led to his mistake. He doesn't need to read the whole encyclopedia just to understand one mistake. So content is not really the king. It's the relevant content 
that needs to be provided to the employee. So content in this sense should be a well-defined, a well-focused, and it should be analyzed from a cognitive scheme theory and not just because uh, we have good books, good libraries, good videos. This is what we should provide. So only relevant content makes a difference. In the same, uh, with the same uh, uh, breath here, large content libraries <clears throat> are useless. Relevance matter, and those large uh, uh, content libraries actually uh, puts a lot of burden on the program managers because they need to uh, almost learn by heart what the con what the library uh, includes, and then they should make decisions which type of content is relevant to whom and when. And the fact is that I don't, from my experience again, I don't remember anyone who provides a lot of content that is a, built as building blocks for different relevant a, needs. It's one big bulk instead of having a relevant micro dimension learning pieces or pieces of learning. Another myth, videos. Uh, I think that the myth is a, a, a brought to the community in two, in two waves. One was that the uh, computer-based training was too long, too textual. A, a, a couple of years ago, there were two vendors that uh, probably <clears throat> pushed to change the, the content landscape and moved from, let's say, standard computer-based computer training to uh, to video libraries, the second wave is from the young uh, the young age uh, experience about TikTok and uh, Twitter <clears throat> and the uh, and the uh, Instagram, but honestly, practice is much more critical for behavior change than videos. So it might be flattering, it might be amusing, but we are not in the entertainment business. We're in the behavior change and risk reduction business. Mike, I'm going to yeah. jump in at this stage because I'm very keen to open up the discussion here as well. Um, I, I don't want to cut your presentation short, but when we started our conversations, this was a very, very important point to you, that practice is what it's all about. Right. That it's not necessarily knowledge. It's more about practice. Um, can I just tease that out of you a bit more at this stage? I, I, unless there's massive stuff that you still want to say. No, in no, presentation. no, no. This, no. This seems to be the critical point here in, in, in your... Um, in your perspective here is it's about practice and I go back to your sports training as well. Indeed, indeed. A practice a, makes our mind changing. Practice is the point when we are collecting or putting together different pieces of knowledge When we are adding one building block and another one and another one, practice 
is actually changing the plus, the adding effort. It changes structure of the knowledge, but it's not practicing the knowledge. It's practicing or it's working on the adding effort. So we are combining two pieces of knowledge together only by practice, not by so-called understanding. The same goes for culture, practice, behaving, execution is where we are demonstrating our assumptions about something. So that's the reason why we see practice as the critical path in any learning process, whether it's driving, sailing, cooking, researching, only in practice, you get your practical knowledge. So that's the reason why this is the <clears throat> main point uh, when, we're, when you are starting to understand what we're missing in the so-called awareness approach. That's the role of practice. And, and how do you see that? being bridged how do you see us getting better at the practice bit uh, it's very simple if you have a if you have a let's say one hour of training okay a, how much time will be dedicated to practice 10 minutes five minutes or 55 minutes or 85 minutes. Or even at all in some cases. Or even, yeah. So <clears throat> what would I suggest as a general uh, or, or as a rule of thumb, start always with a question, with an exercise and keep five minutes to analyze it. Then move to the next exercise. Again, five minutes analysis, and then move to the next one. But if you have a lecture or a computer-based training that is running through even only 15 minutes long, it's 15 minutes, it's 15 minutes uh, too much, okay? And you should replace it with any a opportunity to practice. That's how it trans how we transform our approach to a practical one. And that is such a challenge. Ian Cruxton has said that part of the challenge, and I'm just going to expand on this point, Ian, part of the challenge is that the starting point for so many awareness programs is compliance. That organizations really just want to get through the compliance gate. They don't really want to change behavior. They're not really that interested. They just want to make sure that they're complying with whatever regulations uh, they're complying with. Um, we also have a massive community of really dedicated, hardworking, committed security, awareness, culture, behavior, specialists, practitioners. We all want to do a good job. Um, but the two biggest constraints that I've found in, I don't know, 50 years in this business is that, first of all, the organizations aren't that interested. This Ian's point. They just want compliance. And also our community are not that interested. Security <laughs> is not something that they really give a damn about. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that in many cases, awareness efforts do struggle. Um, behavior change efforts do struggle. Uh, I suppose, how 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 do you see transforming those challenges? How does how does what your your perspective change that? How does it what does it look like? Yeah. So first of all, <clears throat> I totally agree that compliance uh, serves as a major uh, driver 
for awareness training. But uh, fortunately, I see a huge change in the industry. Uh, when we started uh, about uh, 10 years ago, indeed compliance uh, uh, was maybe number one uh, uh, motivation to implement awareness training programs. Today, we see a much more mature approach and uh, I think that uh, the media and the real threat landscape uh, are doing good for us as a community because they put a lot of pressure on the on the top uh, management uh, teams. Uh, we see it already as a requirement for from uh, board members. And I think that uh, if you implement a readiness first approach, it will help you to convince that uh, an effectiveness, effective, sorry, an effective program is much more relevant for your organization than a must have compliance program. A practical approach, readiness first approach, makes it more so-called gamified, more uh, ability uh, to reflect results, trends on behavior change. So it's a much more vivid uh, experience for your management team than following who completed uh, this uh, module, uh, what was the exact uh, score on the last test. So <clears throat> breaking the myth will help you uh, to, uh, to convince your audience that you need to leave compliance uh, as a second driver and not as your first driver. We're getting some great points coming in from the audience. Um, Emily says, the myth that really impacts support for awareness programs is the belief that technology can protect us from all the threats and that we have too much reliance just on the technical technical controls and, and that will never change. Um, Raymond says people can be aware and show they are aware. They can even give great examples and demonstrate they understand. The problem is that their day-to-day -day tasks takes their attention. Everything else is a distraction. Um, and that distraction is the way that the prim gets in. These are all issues that we've all struggled with forever. Um, I, I'm really just um, asking you what you feel is the difference that you can bring to this debate, because we have to continue in the real world. We have to achieve compliance. We have to work with the budgets we've got. We have to use the tools that are available to us. What, what do we need to be doing differently, I suppose? And, and so, finally, Claire, as Claire Walden saying, what should that practice look like? And, and, and that's, I suppose, where I'm coming back to the whole time. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, trying to sum, sum it up, uh, I think we need to move uh, <clears throat> to move in our approach uh, and decide who comes first. The employees come first, the, techno the, the tech teams, the IT teams comes first, your management team comes first. They all should uh, share the same assumptions about what is important because this is the definition of security culture. Okay, culture, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is the shared basic assumptions between <clears throat> among certain groups. So if your employees are thinking that it's annoying and it's only a must have, okay? So you are fighting against them. If your management team share the same approach, you are fighting them. So you need to understand where are you living, in which neighborhood, who are your neighbors, who are in favor of you, and who are against you. 
I'm running this fight for the last 40 something years. And I always uh, put practice, experience. Uh, I'm trying to kill lectures. Okay. <clears throat> I don't believe that uh, providing more and more knowledge is helpful. We should put <clears throat> experience in more and more as number one priority. Now, <clears throat> uh, we all tend to, uh, to believe that data is, uh, uh, should be supported. So indeed, <clears throat> we're using a lot of data, but I can, I can, a, uh, a, uh, I can assure you that data cannot live alone. Still, management looks at data in a different way that you were uh, intended. Uh, even our customers don't believe the data in many cases. Um, so it's an ongoing struggle, but you need <clears throat> If you want a, 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 my first tip or the only tip, change the definition of your role, of your space, of your program, and put awareness aside. Try to deal with experience, experiencing learning, readiness, this is our definition, a behavior change, risk reduction, but don't rely on awareness slash compliance. It's kind of cosmetics, but it makes a difference. Um, there's a, a poll gone up there. If anybody would like to continue this conversation with you, I, I would. Um, I'm 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 very open about this whole discussion. We don't have the answers. Your voice is a refreshing new voice, one that I've not heard before. You're, not all of your points I would necessarily 100% agree with, and I'm still not completely sure how we change the challenges that we all face. But I certainly, I want to continue this conversation. I want, I would like for you to continue it with our membership as well. So if anybody would like to just continue that conversation with Cyber Ready, just connect the box, click the box, and we'll put you in touch with Mike. Um, or you can just reach out to him directly. Um, but it's if, yeah, if we yeah. if it's working, Martin. Technically, you can scan the barcode, and uh, it will lead us a. Uh, uh, to our <clears throat> to our website if you want to see how it how it looks in reality as a program, as a running program, right? That reflects all the ideas that uh, I defined it as the new reality as opposed to the current myth, okay? That's if you want to see how it works. And and what I'm saying to our community is that um, they, <laughs> careful, that might be a fishing test. Uh, I don't think so on this occasion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just I welcome all voices to this debate and I would encourage everyone in our community to be uh, open minded and talk to listen to everyone that's that's trying to bring a new perspective, not new ideas. There are no new ideas. It's all about perspective. It's it's what's working, what isn't working and what can we change to make what isn't working work better. And and that's that's why I so enjoyed our conversations when we first met. I've enjoyed today. Um, I'm very conscious that uh, you were challenging, quite challenging in some of the things you were saying, which that's our way, Mike. We like that. We yeah, like that very right. much indeed. So, um, Is there anybody out there okay. that's got anything else to say? We've got a few minutes left. I've um, 
Claire, I've answered your question, I hope. What should that practice look like? Or is that too big a question, says Claire? The practice depends on what it is you're trying to reinforce, I'm guessing, and the, the methods are, are, are many and varied. Um, on the chat side, uh, I think we have covered off all of the various chats. Is there anybody else out there that wants to say anything? Ian, good thought provoking discussion. Yeah, I think that sums it up, Ian. A good thought provoking discussion, one that I think warrants anybody that's interested in it, taking it up directly with Mike and his team. And we would uh, we would encourage you to do that if you if you wish to. Um, and Claire, yes, interesting points to take forward. This presentation will be available on the website, as usual. Um, I would encourage you to go back to it if you want to consider some of the points. I'm quite sure that Mike won't mind if you if you use some of his points in your debates internally with your teams and your leaderships. Um, Mike, is there anything else you want to, to say at this stage? Um, <clears throat> nothing but thank you from a really deeply <clears throat> from my heart, Martin. It was a pleasure and uh, I hope we will continue uh, our discussions about awareness training. Uh, I do believe that uh, we have a lot in a lot in common, and uh, if someone uh, feels that he needs some uh, partners uh, to fight, uh, to fight for the truth, uh, personally, I will be happy to assist. And I guess you are, uh, you will be joining me, or I will be joining you. Uh, of course. Um, if you could unshare, that would be marvellous. And I will just come back to the main screen so that we can see each other properly. Um, Nadia, are you OK? Is everything good with you? I think so. Um, could we be having such kind of presentations periodically, says Simon. Simon, I, I suspect you're you're from. Yes, you are from Nairobi. We have a lot in common in Africa and I would like to have a partner in Nairobi. Um, please reach out to Mike. Um, and we do have these presentations all the time. Uh, this is one of the greatest themes of, of the SASI community is the behavior change, culture change thing. So do join in regularly, Simon. And with that, sir, I can only wish you to go away and try and have a lovely break. I know that you've got family with you. You're traveling around Europe. Um, I hope the weather stays good for you. Uh, and I'd like on behalf of our community to thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope this is not the last time that we speak. Right. Thank you once again, Martin. It was my pleasure. And look, come on, everybody. You know, I love these little hands going up and you all do your little. <laughs> that's what we love. I know I'm only 12 years old. You see, I just love it when we see things <laughs> like that. You've um, I suspect you've won a lot of friends here this morning, sir. Um, this is uh, it's always refreshing to hear a new perspective. We're grateful for your time um, and we wish you all the best going forward. Let's hope that we can help each other in that respect. Take care and uh, take care all the rest of you. See you at a webinar um, coming near you soon. If anybody hasn't signed up for the legal SASIG, I think that one's also available online, um, but that's only on Thursday. It's not too late. Take care, everyone. And if nothing else, we'll see you at uh, the International Cyber Expo. SASIG has its own lounge. I shall be there um, holding court and dishing out free coffee to anybody that wants to come along and say hello to SASIG at the, in the SASIG lounge. Bye-bye, everybody. Take bye -bye. care. Thank you.